Hey guys, how's it going? So I am into part four of my top 100 albums. In this episode, I'm going to be covering 70 through 61. And I know kind of the question everybody's asking is, where are the Beatles? Where are the Beach Boys? Where's Pink Floyd? Where's the Rolling Stone? I know. Look, there's a lot of great albums that I have to cover. And unfortunately, there's not going to be every single Beatle album represented, or they're not going to be a lot of Beach Boys. As I'm going through my list, I just can't, in good conscience, justify leaving some of these records off in favor of a lot of Beach Boys, Beatles, or what I consider to be my less than favorite Pink Floyd album. So there, there's going to be some of that for sure, but I just happen to really like all these albums. It's such a hard decision to make. When you're trying to whittle it down to 100, you're going to have to leave a lot from your favorite artists off just to make sure that so many great albums are represented. And so, yeah, I know. I was kind of thinking that to myself earlier, like, God, you haven't shown a single Beatle album or Beach Boys or Pink Floyd. I mean, all these artists that are uh, my favorite bands have not yet had any albums. So, I think you can kind of guess it's going to be a little top heavy as we get near the top of the list. But anyway, I appreciate all the comments. Everybody has been very kind. I've seen a couple of people like Glenn Calloway just recently jumped in. He's doing a 101 albums to hear before you die, which is a very cool uh, concept. Um, and so I am looking forward to checking out his list as well. Any other YouTubers who want to do something, uh, the same, I think it'd be very fascinating to see what your list look like. So anyway, without any further ado, going to get into, uh, what, what did I say? What did I say? 70. Going to start off with number 70. The Birds, Sweetheart of the Radio. This is my favorite Birds album. I feel like this is... The only Birds album that is from top to bottom, excellent. I mean, I like the early Birds. I like Mr. Tambourine Man, Turn, 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 uh, Fifth Dimension. I, I love Younger Than Yesterday, but there's always a couple of stinkers, a couple of filler tracks uh, on those records. And the same cannot be said for Sweetheart of the Rodeo. They have Graham Parsons now in the lineup. They booted David Crosby uh, to the curb with the Notorious Bird Brothers. Um, I think they just kicked out Michael Clark because he was a pain in the ass. And so basically from the original Birds lineup, you only have um, Jim Roger McGuinn and the other dude with the afro. What's his name? Um, I can't think of it right now. He was on the Flying Burrito Brothers Chris Hillman. Chris Hillman. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Chris Hillman. Um, and then you've got, uh, who else do you have on here? I don't know. I'm not, uh, you got Grant Parsons guitar, Kevin Kelly drums, um, and John Corneo drums, Lloyd Green steel guitar. Um, so you got some fine Nashville musicians on here. And the world was not really prepared for country rock when this album came out. I think the Birds actually played the Grand Ole Opry and got booed off the stage because they had long hair and were hippies. And at that time, uh, they just didn't want to know. Uh, but nonetheless, great, great album. And I'm not a big country fan. You know me. I don't show country records, but I love this. There's almost like a bluegrass flavor to it. It's definitely country rock, not necessarily like the Eagles country rock, if that's what you're into. Uh, they cover the Leuven Brothers on here. Um, I'm not in, familiar enough with uh, a lot of the country artists to really know, but I do know You Ain't Going Nowhere is a Bob Dylan cover. Um, I'm a Pilgrim. It just kind of got this, and I don't know, I can't explain why I like it. Because to listen to this, you would think this would be the farthest thing from my taste. But it all works. I love it. Hickory Wind is great. You're still on my mind is a great song. Uh, Pretty Boy Floyd. Um, I like the Christian life. Yeah, that one too. I love that one. I don't know why the harmonies are great. So... Don't judge me. All right. What did I say? 70. So now we're into 69. Where's the who? You always claim to be a who fan. Where's okay. 
Are you happy now? Quadrophenia. Why is Quadrophenia so low? It's excellent. Yeah, I know it is. It's just not a favorite, not as big a favorite of mine as some of the other. So settle down. Okay? Quadrophenia, a double album. Now at this point, Pete Townsend's like, oh man. You know, nobody dug my whole light, life house concept. The band didn't understand what it was about. They all told me I was crazy. The record company was like, you're out of your mind. And so he felt like he had another concept album in him. Another double album concept, nonetheless. And so we got Quadrophenia. Yeah, great album. Is it uh, excellent from start to finish? No, there's some weak stuff on here. Um, I mean, Cut My Hair is okay. I think the um, second disc is kind of, uh, you know, where for me it starts to lose me a little bit. Dr. Jimmy, um, I, you know, I'm just not a, a bellboy's okay. It's a Keith Moon vocal and all that. But what you really hear when you're listening to this album is the real me. I love uh, I Am The Sea, that little overture. Well, actually, Quadrophenia is more of the overture. But I love that little beginning part, the I Am The Sea, where it's just kind of the, the sound of the sea rolling along the beach. And then it's interesting because of the um, overture doesn't come until after the real me, which is the song Quadrophenia. Uh, the Punk Meets a Godfather is a, a standout track. You know, Helpless Dancer, did it need to be here? This could have been a single. If this had been a single album, this might have knocked Who's Next out of the water. I'm just saying, it feels like a little bit of padding uh, to make this a double album. Uh, but 515, obviously, is great. Love Rain or, Rain or Me. Love Rain, don't say over me, DJ or YouTuber. Don't say... Don't say Love Rain Over Me. It's Rain or Me. Uh, but it's one of the best tracks Pete Townsend ever wrote. One of the best Roger Daltrey vocals. So, yeah, it's a great album. And I I don't mind that it's a double album. I mean, I listen to it. I'm just saying, as far as if we're trying to match the quality of Who's Next, even Tommy, I just don't think this is necessarily up to snuff. But it's good enough that it made it all the way into the 50s on my list. Oh, 60s. All right. All right, 60s, whatever this was, 69, okay? 69 Quadrophenia. All right, where are we at? 68, Talking Heads, 77, their debut album. Strong, strong debut album from the Talking Heads. I mean, Psycho Killers on here. And just the whole quirky, weird David Byrne element uh, to this band is just all over here. Uh oh, love comes to town. Has there ever been another song that had uh oh in the title? No. Does he say uh oh in the song? I don't think he does. But that's David Byrne for you. New feeling, uh, no compassion. Just classic classics on here. If you only know this album for Psycho Killer or Pulled Up, maybe Pulled Up's a great pop song. You need to check this thing out. I mean, seriously. Uh, don't worry about the government. The book I read, killer, killer. This should have been released in the 80s. Maybe would have gotten more attention, but love this album. 67. Is that right? 67, 68, 67. Automatic for the People, REM. Yeah, I'm a big REM fan. What the hell is Automatic for the People doing solo? I know. But you have to understand this about me. I am an 80s REM fan. I like the 90s REM. I appreciate Out of Time, Automatic for the People, Monster, like all that stuff. Like, I dig it. I do. But as far as me, and again, just to remind everybody, I mean, this is, these are my favorites. So even though it doesn't make sense on anybody else's list necessarily to rank this at number 67, for me, I just find I like the 80s REM albums. I have more of a connection to those records. So... This is your favorite REM album. I I totally understand. This is a fantastic album. I love this. Drive. Try Not to Breathe. Everybody Hurts. Sweetness Follows. Mine got a raw deal. And the knock against this, and I remember when this came out and I was in college and everybody's like, can we have enough of the goddamn mandolin, Peter Buck? For Christ's sake, do we have to have another slow, acoustic, folky, you know, kind of like if... 
Led Zeppelin four had done Led Zeppelin, or I'm sorry, if Led Zeppelin had done Led Zeppelin three again for Led Zeppelin four, people would have been like, okay, we get it. You can play the mandolin. Can we move on? Can we get back to the heavy shit? And that was kind of what I remember, at least when this album was released, people were like, oh God, come on. Can you just rock out like you did on Green and Lysaurus Pageant and Document? But after a while, people kind of came around and warmed to it once they realized how brilliant tracks like Man on the Moon were. Find the River's a great closing track. And this is a great Sunday morning listening album. It's not too heavy. It just kind of, it sets a great mood. Dinner music, maybe, if you will. But it's just something, it's a quieter album. Doesn't really rock too heavy. I mean, the, the hardest rocking song on here is Ignore Land. It's the closest thing to, like, the heavier REM that we had before. But... You know, I think that's why they overcorrected with Monster and just kind of turned the knobs to 11 and rocked out like really hard on Monster. But this is a great album. All right. Um, 60. Sorry as I do the math in my head. I should be better prepared. I know. 66. It wasn't released in 66. It was released a year later. I'm talking about the Monkees. Yeah, my second Monkees album to make my list. Pisces, uh, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricorn, and Jones. That's a mouthful. It was released in the Summer of Love. Released after Sgt. Pepper. So I think some of the brilliance of this album was kind of lost because everyone was blown away by Sgt. Pepper. But nonetheless... This is an amazing album. And no, the Monkees didn't play all the instruments on this one like they did the previous album, Headquarters. But truth be told, Headquarters, the playing on that sounded a bit sloppy at times. And I think the Monkees realized, you know, that Don Kirchner, he was kind of onto something when he had a bunch of session musicians playing on our records. And I'm sure Mike Nesmith, is on, Mike Nesmith is on here. I'm sure Peter Tork is on here. You got Mickey Dolans who wrote a few songs. But this is kind of back to the Monkees winning formula. You got Salesman on here, which Michael Nesmith did not write. And that's another thing. Michael Nesmith is such a great songwriter, but he's got like on here, Salesman, which he sings as a cover song. What am I doing hanging around is a song that he didn't write. I don't understand why there weren't more Mike Nesmith compositions on here. And I like Don't Call On Me. I think that's great. Daily Nightly, which he did not sing on, which Mickey Dolan sang on. And it was one of the first uh, I think, recorded pop songs with the Moog uh, synthesizer, which is pretty flashy. Even before the Beatles used it on Abbey Road, the Monkees were using it. But, I mean, this is just a, a, a pop masterpiece. You got She Hangs Out, The Door into Summer, Love is Only Sleeping, Cuddly Toy, the Harry Nielsen cover, Words, um, Hard to Believe, one of the better Davy Jones songs for my money. Um, uh, Peter Percival Patterson's Porky, uh, right into Pleasant Valley Sunday, the Goffin and King composition, which I think is um, probably one of the songs that the Monkees are best known for, um, and Star Collector, way before uh, the Rolling Stones came out with Star Star. So yeah, Pisces, Aquarius, and Jones. All right, 65, another, this is like the, the debut uh, album episode, I feel like, because we got Pretenders right here, their debut. Um, yeah, I mean, this kind of ushered in, I want to maybe not ushered in, but, you know, right around this time, you had the Pretenders, you had Blondie, soon you would have, you know, like the Motels and Berlin and Till Tuesday and... Um, you know, the Go-Go's and all these other fantastic um, bands that were fronted by female singers. But, you know, Precious is on here. Um, you've got the uh, Stop Your Sobbing, the Kink cover. Um, and I love uh, some of the deeper tracks, too. Oh, I'm sorry, Brass and Pocket as well. There was that video on MTV. Um, yeah, I mean, everything on here is just solid. Tattooed Love Boys. Uh, Lovers of Today, Mystery Achievement, check that one out. If you're a fan of New Wave, like early 80s, moody New Wave, uh, check out that one. Uh, but solid, solid record. And uh, very unfortunately, 
uh, two of these guys would be dead before the third Pretenders album. That's how hard. I, I believe it was um, James Honeyman Scott and uh, Pete Farndon, I think, both just OD'd. Uh, couldn't handle the success. Couldn't handle being a rock star. And there you go. All right. We are down to 64. And... The Joshua Tree, U2. U2 was never the same after this album. Even after, you know, I mean, you could argue that Rattle and Hum kind of had some Joshua Tree elements. But this was sort of the end of the road for the very serious, topical, brooding, very stoic uh, U2 of the 80s. Which, by the way, I love. Don't get me wrong. I love that era of U2. And then I think with Rattle and Hum, it kind of all fell apart. People were like, you guys are pretentious assholes. They came out with a movie that was in black. Pretentious black and white. And they were covering, or, you know, they were having their picture taken alongside pictures of Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash. And they were doing duets with B.B. King and... People were kind of ready to knock him off their high horse, and so Rattle and Hum kind of took a beating. And then they're like, "All right, we gotta we gotta reinvent ourselves." And then they came out with Octung Baby. But still, I love this. Got it on cassette when it came out, and it is just one of those albums. There's not a weak track on here. I mean, side one is really for everybody. What they know, where the streets have no name. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Which is very weird. Like a few years earlier, that would have never gotten on the radio. Nobody would have ever put that out as a single. But it's 1987. Uh, bands are stretching out their sound. People are getting tired of the drum machine, cheesy synthesizer sound. And people are uh, more open to songs with, you know, at least on the radio, songs with a very heavy gospel influence, with or without you. Which, when that came out, I thought, what an odd choice for a single. Like, it doesn't sound like U2. It doesn't sound like anything they'd put out as a single before that point. Bullet the Blue Sky is a great track. And then, but uh, my favorite is Side 2. Um, I love, you know, the way it starts out in God's Country. Uh, or, I, I, that's not the first song on Side 1. What is it? Uh, Red Hill Mining Town. And then right into God, um, In God's Country. Um... Running to Stand, Stand Still is a great... I mean, just name a track off here, and they're all brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I can't say enough about it. Unfortunately, I think because of the crap that YouTube's put out in the last two decades, people have really um, kind of fallen out of love with U2. Uh, very unfortunately, because, you know, people always love Pearl Jam, but... People will not have not always loved U2. Hopefully, there's some kind of U2 renaissance coming, um, but I don't know. But Joshua Tree, great album, no denying that one. 63, uh, yeah, going to go back to heavy metal, and I know I showed one by this band in my last installment, but going to go back to Black Sabbath for Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath. Um, yeah, I love this album. Uh, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, the title track is great. National Acrobat is great. Fluff, even, is a bit charming. Um, you know, kind of that Tony Iommi little instrumental thing. Then Sabra Cadabra. Uh, I love Killing Yourself to Live. Who Are You? Uh, which is just strictly synthesizer-based is very cool. Um, looking for today. Love that. Ozzy, such a melodic vocal on there. And that Spiral Architect, my favorite song on the whole album. Just an epic way to close out this album. And the artwork is second to none. I love the yin and the yang. The nightmare and then waking up to realize it was only a dream. Um, yeah, I mean, enough cannot be said about that album for sure. 62. Yeah, I got to get some Elvis Costello in here. This year's model, his second album, his first really with the attractions. Uh, I mean, where to begin on this masterpiece? You got Pump It Up, which I think most people would know on here. What's so funny about Peace, Love, and Understanding, which I think that was a cover song, actually. Um, you know, This Year's Girl on here is fantastic. Just from start to bottom. 
uh, this album. Uh, Lip Service is another great one on here. I mean, it's one of those. It's solid all the way through. There's not a single track where it's like, well, oh, that's okay. No, this is brilliant. And Elvis Costello, I don't think, put out a bad album or at least a mediocre album until you might say, um, what was that one of the 80s? Goodbye, Cruel World. For me, anyway, you may disagree, but uh, this is one of his best. And where's the Beatles? Come on. You're going to go a whole nother four episodes without showing the Beatles? Okay, I fine. Ha are you happy now? God, you're on me about the who. You're on me about the Beatles. Here we go. Okay, Hard Day's Night. And by me showing Hard Day's Night right now, you know, okay, Please Please Me is not going to be on this list. With the Beatles, ain't going to be on this list. Yellow Submarine ain't going to be on this So can we just at least have that out of the way? So, Hard Day's Night, again, amazing album, and especially when you take into account the heavy workload that the Beatles were going through at this time. Beatlemania had just taken hold in the U.S. They'd already put two albums out. They were expected to put out, you know, like almost four albums a year, uh, you know, 20 singles a year. I mean, it was just a ridiculous workload. I know I'm exaggerating. This was their third album. But still, they had a movie that they made. They were going on tour. They're really trying to, you know, establish themselves as a great band, which, you know, by the evidence here, was very obvious. At this point, it was like, yeah, there's the Beatles, and then there's everybody else. I mean, you got A Hard Day's Night. I should have known better. The ballads on here are some of the best Beatle ballads on any album. If I Fell, Love That, I'll Be Back. You know, people crap on When I Get Home. That is a great song. I don't care. You may not like it. I love it to death. Any Time at All is a great track. Things We Said Today is one of my favorite Paul McCartney uh, songs of all time. Yes, it is. The only weak track on here, if we're being honest, is I'm Happy Just to Dance With You. And not just because George sings it. I think they gave him a throwaway song, kind of like they gave Ringo, I Want to Be Your Man, like here. And can you blame them? I mean, come on, you know, having to put out as much material as they had to back in the day and make it all excellent was really, you know, you can understand how there'd be a clunker here or there, but I'm happy just to dance with you. It's not a bad song. I mean, if another band had put it out, uh, you know, it might have been the best song on their album. I don't know. But And I Love Her, another great ballad. So Can't Buy Me Love, you know, Hello. It's an embarrassment of riches. It really is. Listen to this album. Pull this album out. Listen to it. Hard Day's Night. I Should Have Known Better. Um, if I Fell. Can't Buy Me Love. Uh, you Can't Do That. You Can't Do That was a B-side. A Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it boggles the mind. I'll Cry Instead. You know, kind of that early country rock influence. People say, oh, well, the monkeys were were country before anybody else. No, they were not. Listen to this. Listen to I'll Cry Instead. On the next album, listen to I'm a Loser. Okay, the Beatles were still ahead of the game in the country rock genre. So there. Anyway, anyway, that is my number six. Is it number Shoot, yeah, that is my uh, 71. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, I, I really, uh, yeah, it's all kind of blurring together. Yeah, anyway, that was my next top 10. Can we leave it at that? That was my next 10, whatever the numbering system was. I'm pretty sure that was, I'm pretty sure that was, um, that was 61. Yes, I, I know, I'm losing my mind here doing all these videos, but this one ran a little over. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but thanks for watching.